the frustrations that Powell dealt with once he came back uh, was uh, the, the frustration of trying to convince the Congress uh, that that the West couldn't sustain the level of population and the type of development that the Congress wanted to impose on the region. I mean, they were trying to pound a square peg into a round hole. As pioneers went west, the first thing that had to be done was to banish the idea that this was in any sense a desert. These poor pioneers had no idea how dry it was out there. They were going into a region that couldn't be farmed without irrigation. And nobody was talking about irrigation at the time. We grow corn or squash, melons, uh, beans. I guess naturally we just learn how to use the water conservatively. Uh -huh. Because we never had any water. We live in arid land, you know. We just... And you don't irrigate any of that? No, we all depend on the rain. That's why we have to pray every day. The Hopis have lived near the Colorado for a thousand years. Oh yeah, we like that. On the heels of our triumph at Hoover came a time in American history when we had the money and resolve to build on a grand scale, to subdue the rivers of the West and to make them do our bidding. The original mission of the Bureau of Reclamation to reclaim the arid West uh, was, was a calling that had some real vision to it. In 1933, there was a stamp that said conservation. It was red, and it was a picture of a dam. So that was conservation then. So there is this great big rush to see how many dams we could build in this century, no matter what the consequences would be later. The impact that, that large stor mainstream storage reservoirs had on salmon and other fishery resources was something that was recognized and then dismissed. That was the cost. That was the price that one paid for development. Redskin fishermen from five tribes are mighty busy making what may be their last haul at historic Salilo Falls. Banishing salmon for the banishing red men. Winter food for the tribes. Hydroelectric dams, flood control dams, irrigation dams in California, Arizona, Montana, on the Gunnison, Green, Missouri, and a hundred other rivers. Even plans to reroute the Columbia a thousand miles south into the Colorado. Before computers, environmental impact studies, or federal deficits, we built a thousand major dams. Over the next 30 years, we engineered dryness out of existence. Hoover Dam, Bonneville Dam, Shasta, Grand Coulee, and then Fort Peck Dam. We were building the five largest structures on Earth simultaneously, all in one region of one country. Roll on, Columbia, roll on. Roll on, Columbia, roll on. After Hoover, we turned to the Columbia greatest salmon river in the world. By 1955, we and the Canadians had built 55 dams on the Columbia and its tributaries. On up the river at Grand Coulee And Grand Coulee was so big that when engineers who worked on Hoover went up there and looked at that canyon and imagined this dam four-fifths of a mile wide and 550 feet high, they said it made Hoover look like nothing. By Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. On a whirlwind U.S. tour, he expresses the hope that such a dam might be built in his native country. By 1956, 90% of the salmon were gone, and almost no stretch of the Columbia was not a reservoir. Then, there was unfinished business on the Colorado. In the 19 20s they came down in here and actually did a full trip through the Grand Canyon and identify a whole series of dams that essentially would have backed up the Colorado River in a series of stair-step reservoirs all the way from the Mexico-United States line all the way up into Wyoming and Colorado. The Bureau began work on the dam in Glen Canyon. It would generate hydropower for Phoenix and revenue to pay for other dams and would submerge 186 miles of canyon. The big dam in the Colorado River, the one with the big capacity, would be Glen Canyon Dam, the 26 million acre foot capacity reservoir, 186 miles long. That was the big one, that was the money maker. 
It wasn't for irrigation, it was just to make hydroelectric power. Glen Canyon was one of the most remote spots in America, a hundred miles from the nearest paved road. Here, Powell found the river smooth and deep, with Anasazi ruins on the banks. Barely 200 people had ever been through the canyon. The first year I ran down Glen Canyon was in 1954. And as we come near Lee's Ferry, probably 15 or so miles above Lee's Ferry, there's marks on the wall. There's something going on over there. There's piles of dirt. I looked up, we did, and there, 600 or more feet above us, little dots, little guys, way up on top of the rim. We looked through the binoculars, and they were surveyors. I said, geez, those are surveyors. They're going to damn this canyon. Glen Canyon, as it was. Glen Canyon, as it will be. At 11.30 on the morning of October 15th, 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower triggered a blast far smaller than the atomic explosions now nearly so commonplace. Some of the rock scaling had already been done. I marveled at it because here was a sheer wall canyon, a muddy river running through it, and I, I tried to visualize Hoover Dam already in place. That was what we were doing. We were building a duplicate of Hoover. It staggered me to, to, to think of the, of the job yet to be done. Reclamation chief was the legendary Floyd Dominey. Floyd Dominey is a household world in the 17 western states, the reclamation area. Kennedy called me the nation's water boy when uh, Senator Jackson had prevailed on Udall to suggest that maybe it was time for me to retire, all I had to do was alert the White House that, uh, that these people were uh, twisting my tail and pinching a little, and uh, it stopped. Lyndon took care of it. He's uh, sort of the, uh, the role model for a lot of, of ways that the Bureau approached things. It was more of a damn the torpedoes, uh, let's get this son of a bitch built. And he, he, he got a lot of it built. Uh, remember that uh, hydroelectric energy is the only pollution-free energy that's created. It's renewable. You don't burn up a coal mine, or you don't mine out a mine, you don't drill out a well, you don't have 25,000-year half-life full of rods from the atomic power. I think it's a shame that we haven't developed every single possible kilowatt from this renewable, non-polluting source of energy. Everyone in the, in the Bureau of Reclamation, including Western congressmen and senators, firmly believe that the reclamation program was a must for the growth and expansion of the West. And we had no dissenters in the, in the 40s and 50s, early 50s at least. It was everybody gung-ho, and uh, let's get it done. The great moment on dam construction is when you finally realize that if you, you put the last bucket of concrete on the top of the dam and that you now are prepared to close the tunnel and let the river start making its way up to the spillway levels uh, and, and fill the lake. When Glen Canyon Dam was nearly complete, David Brower, executive director of the Sierra Club, visited the condemned canyons for the first time. Brower and the Sierra Club had stopped a dam on the Green River in exchange for not objecting to the dam in Glen Canyon. Glen Canyon used to be filled with beavers. There's no beaver in there anymore. Uh, good fishing in there. It was just a nice, quiet, no rapids to speak of, and some very historic spots in there. It's just a nice place. There must have been 125 to 30 canyons, each one of them with the stream in it. But you walk up this little stream, then you turn left, and suddenly you're in one of the most remarkable places on Earth. It's a huge amphitheater. It's, oh, much bigger than most of the cathedrals I've been in. Just a little slot of sky up on top. A little bit of water coming over a waterfall at the head of this 